want to welcome you tonight on behalf of the uh, Melrose Area Historical Society. This is a play that is written and directed by Herman Lensing.
since the flood, the river did rise. In one night, it went from as low as I have seen it to running over top of the ledge, and it's still rising. The footbridge went off in the night. It looks as if it will be a week before we can begin work again. They say the river rose five feet, and that some bridges are gone. This will make it bad for you as you try to get through. Moses Adley has been gone for two weeks and has not yet been home. Now the river has subsided a bit, but provisions are slow in coming. We are getting some work done. If we can get some teams across the river by the first of the week, the framing can go right along. It is unfortunate you left. A man has recently returned from Sox Center. He said that in that community, the word is that you have left and the dam was carried away. If the good weather holds, all we will have lost is time. These are hard times, Edwin. We are in hope that further provisions will arrive soon. They say that in Richmond, beans can be bought for $4 a bushel. However, our store is all ready with counters and shelves, and we are selling our flour. Now, if the potatoes were grown, it would not be so bad, but there's nothing to fall back on. I hope our family members are doing fine, and look forward to when you return with them. I know you could have been closer than St. Cloud, but it is fortunate you are not on the road. I would not have the women folk come up until the roads are safe. I shall write then. William Clark. The Clarks were businessmen, speculators, and to some degree visionaries. Edwin Clark has often been called the father of Melrose. It is a title that he most generously accepted and to some degree gave to himself. While a number of people contributed to Melrose's early years, it was Clark who set in motion the event which let people know that Melrose had something to offer. He did it in 1871. And he did it with a letter. Melrose, Minnesota, October 27, 1871. To Mr. George Becker, President of the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. Sir, being desirous to secure the location of your line of railroad through our proposed town site at Melrose, we make the following proposition to the same. First, we will give the railroad company the right of way through our land free of expense. Second, we will convey to your railroad company perfect title, one half of all the lots to be laid out in the proposed town site at Melrose as may be selected by your agent, also such other grounds as he may select. Third, the owners of the land along the proposed line of the railroads in the town of Melrose demand payment for right of way through said town, then we shall agree to pay all such amounts as the railroad commission may adjudge them unless satisfactory settlement could otherwise be made. Now, from the railroad commission, we can expect the following. First, location of the railroad through our proposed town of Melrose. Second, the location and maintenance of a passenger and freight depot at or near section 34 or 35. Third, no other station to be located or established within six miles of said station at Melrose. All of which is respectively submitted for your consideration, Edward and William Clark, Melrose. Clark's letter did indeed bring the railroad to Melrose. The story is that as soon as the company received the letter, they decided, yes, they would take the option. Some of the people came, many of them early and mainly from the east. They settled here, bringing with them visions of creating and improving on the life they had lived. They were, for the most part, Americans, New Englanders generally, and many found life here to be much more difficult than it had been back in their old homes. Others came later, many with the railroad companies, 
They came from Ireland for the most part, and they, or they worked with the, the support businesses, which sprang up from the railroad. More than one of those people have left that land because of oppression in their country. They brought with them the vision of being their own person, and they remembered what it was like to be oppressed. The railroad provided improved contact to the outside world and made it easier for others to come. Many of them came from Central Europe, often from the German lands. Their land had undergone great social change, and many came to the new world hoping to restore a vision of the world. The railroad improved that contact for all of them, and they all came. They had a vision of the world and how life should be lived.
Sometimes I wonder if I would have chosen to come here. I have chosen to live here, but really had no choice in coming here. And choices do matter. I'm standing here what a lot of people don't know. I didn't leave my home because of adventure or work or an opportunity. I left because I wanted to stay alive. That's why I'm worried about this invitation of Father Pierce to his beloved Germans. He wrote the following invitation. I do wish, however, that the choicest pieces of this delightful territory would become the property of our dear German Catholics who would make an earthly paradise of this Minnesota which heaven is richly blessed and who would bear out the opinion that the Germans proved to be the best farmers and Christians and Catholics in the world, in America. I am sure you would likewise do credit to your faith in America, but to prove yourselves good Catholics, do not bring any atheists, red republicans, agitators, or free thinkers. Oh, it's not the Catholic portion or the German the accent that I even mind, but when he is asking them not to bring any free thinkers, then I worry. Oh, I can't wait for you and Greg and our daughter to arrive. Catherine, I love you and I miss you. Can't wait for you to come. I need the familiarity. I really wish this could be as it was back home. The past few years have been so disorganized. You, at least, have been a constant. Waiting for you, always. Free thinker. A free thinker is what I truly am. A free thinker is no grander, nor baser than any other man. I did not ask that title in life so long ago. It was given me by an Englishman because I once said no. What a strange land this is. A land with good crumbs. A land to raise a family, to have a neighborhood. A land where no one knows each other very well. Not like it was in childhood in a quiet German dell. I said no to his vision of a life that was not so grand. I said no to an Englishman and had to leave my land. I walked three days to Erin Shore and who came with me that day. I walked aboard a sailing ship, for I would not say yea. It was a time where people, each one, knew their place. We all cared for each other. Our lives lived by the landscapes. We lived for the village. We plowed each other's fields. The village made the tools for us. We share a harvest field. They said no to their orders, telling me family how to live. I said no to their soldier boy who thought my life was his. I said no to their hateful laws that men be wearing green. I said no to their dirty hands who touched my sister clean. Then they made the changes. They said we were now free. Then they made the changes and destroyed a community. <coughs> and we left our birth land, our village in the Dell. To bring back a town we love so well, we traveled through all hell. Forty days and forty nights, living below decks dark. For forty days and forty nights, myself and another six. Forty days and forty nights in a room, ten by nine by six. There were times when one could almost take no more. There were noises of childhood, sound of the sea coming in during a storm, chasing away rats. deaths were the worst. For the minute the breath is out of the body, the body is flung into the sea, and there's little time for mourning that soul. <coughs> we survived through all those perils. And new ones on these shores. I worked on ships, in fields and woods. I dressed in blue for war. I, I lived through that all that to, to make my home, to, to see, see who lives next to me. For I want the right to say no. I want the right to disagree. I want people I can count on, to that the law should see. And those who grant me any less shall not my neighbor be. Will those folks be my neighbors? I feel this in my bones. He will live beside me now. Will those folks be my neighbors? <coughs> my God, I feel their state. I fear this deep inside me. I feel this in my bones. 
He will live beside me now as I try to make a home. Good fences can make good neighbors. I think we'll start today. Good fences make good neighbors. I know this to be true. Good fences make good neighbors, or so the graybeards say. Good fences make good neighbors and will keep me away from you. I know this deep inside me. I feel this in my bones. I know that fences are the way to let me have my own. This then we are decided. This then we do agree. We will go to different churches, meals, and jobs to build this community. September 1874. Dear Mother, hoping you are well. The big news from Melrose this week was a wedding. Gretchen Dieters married Sean Donahue. For almost everyone, messages went into and out of the area via the written word. It could be via the newspaper, a telegraph, or the post office. It was the post office which was most often used, and a sign that a community had arrived was often one that had a post office. The U.S. Postal System, which Ben Franklin played a major role in organizing, has always sought to improve people's ability to send and receive messages, but those changes were not always well received or liked, as was very evident from a letter printed in 1904 in their Nordstern paper from a person in Meyer Grove. December 20th, 1904, to editor of the Nordstern. From various areas of the country comes the question, what is the matter? Why do you not bother <coughs> hearing from you? Did you enter a period of hibernation? At the beginning of October, we got the news that our post office, which gave general satisfaction, had to fold. We got up an urgent petition with nearly 100 names and humbly begged the Lords in Washington to retain our post office, since it was completely satisfactory. Closure was then postponed until December 1st thought things would continue this way, especially since an employee from St. Paul was here and gave us hopeful assurances that we could keep our post office. Suddenly, like lightning from the blue sky, we were told, when people in Meyer Grove, your post office will discontinue. If only a single Republican were here, but unfortunately, we are all watchful Democrats, and that means be nice and quiet, for you don't know what is best for you. Now we have the fortunate distribution of RFD, Rural Fuel Foolish Delivery, number three from Melrose and number seven from Sox Center. Our friends who wish to continue being in touch with us might remember this address. It took us about two weeks to erect our tin sparrow houses, during which time we received our postal things from Melrose. Now all goes like clockwork, and a progress lives. Adjustments to the new life did not always come easy, and people were not and people were not always appreciated for who they were or where their families had come from. Mixed messages of this new life in America and American success were very obvious concerns to everyone. Diary entry, May seventeenth, nineteen seventeen. It has been very busy here the last few weeks. Our youngest daughter was married three weeks ago to one of August Meyer's boys. It was a wonderful wedding, and much more of a celebration than in our days. There was morning mass, followed by a parade from the church to our home, and then the day-long celebration before Nikki and Maria went to their home. We saw them at mass the Sunday after they were married. And Maria confessed to me that Nikki has already not lived up to being the perfect husband. It seems that he has provided her with a well-furnished home, right down to a new wash machine. It was only after she had the clothes washed and ready for hanging outside that she discovered he had not furnished clothespins. Hopefully all their troubles will be that light. My cousin Gertrude, in her most recent letter to us, indicated that many of her neighbors in St. Paul are concerned about our loyalties in regards to the war presently being fought in Europe. 
In some ways, that attitude has come through even our neighborhood. We are told that soon our mass will have to have English sermons, and we will have to end our Schutzenfest. This does seem ridiculous to me, and so does the fact that many in your town seem to think that we would not be loyal to our country. This land is not our adopted land, but it is our land. I should say not everyone sees it in this manner, but I think overall we consider ourselves Americans. The events of a few days ago, however, should go a long way to putting some rumors to rest. On May 5th, Loyalty Day, almost 200 people attended a meeting saying we were loyal Americans. More would have attended, and it would have been a bit bigger celebration, but our band was part of the big Loyalty Day festival in Melrose. Gertrude, you would have been so proud of them. The day featured speeches by a number of dignitaries, including Governor Birdquest and Bishop Bush. Both said our loyalty was beyond reproach. I know it may not seem like that to everyone. I know that some people out there ask, why don't they speak English? Why must we always do it their way? I don't have an answer. One thing I do find interesting is that while they ask us not to speak German, or sing our songs, or have our Schutzenfest, all to show we're loyal Americans, nobody has asked us to stop making our beer. <laughs> and I doubt if they ever will. Another piece of news is also very welcome. We will soon have telephone service. I still find it amazing that we will be able to talk over wires. In the early 20th century, the telephone came into the area. To some it meant they no longer had to visit or write letters to communicate. To others it meant a chance to visit quickly. The system was refined over the years and numerous improvements were made and it has served as a great way of getting out some of the latest news. Did you hear what happened at Freeport yesterday? No, what? Let me tell you. Coming into the 30s, civilization was here. With cars and phones, nothing untamed lived too near. No wildlife was close to the Freeport vine that one fine day, August 1929. The moonlit peace was broken by a peel of a frightened dog
20th century was the rapid rate of change and the speed in which a change could occur. Now, if you think about it, Thomas Jefferson felt that it would take 600 years for Americans to settle west of the Mississippi. He was wrong by roughly a half a millennium. But that was just settling the land. For better or worse, things moved, and they sometimes moved very fast. Some adjusted well. Others struggled, but all lived through and all marveled at the changes. longer than the time that it takes to deliver this address. The problem is that this is the same day that Janelle, my youngest granddaughter, will be married, and I have to make that ready. Nevertheless, I hope the following experience from my life can help you and give you an understanding of how things have changed from my youth until today. June 30th, 1936. When I think of pioneers and weddings, I always think of horses, because they played a major role in the short courtship, sudden marriage, sudden wedding, and long marriage. All of my children and grandchildren, Janelle has the most interest in what my life was like growing up. And she always liked hearing about my courtship and wedding day. Her mother, my daughter, always finds the story embarrassing. And usually she does her best to keep it quiet. Janelle finds it romantic. They both have good points, of course. I'm reminded of that day again today because Janelle is getting married. Her mother, who was mar married at 25, thinks Janelle, who is 21, is getting married too soon. Some might believe that I consider it too late. I will not judge the issue, but I will say children were not on my mind the day I married. Believe it or not, it was horses. I have never forgotten the day I became Mrs. Stahlberger. I was 15 years old that day, and I have never regretted that decision in the last four and a half decades. Janelle was the only person who ever asked if I remembered what Paul, my husband, was wearing when he came to our door to pick up his bride. I don't, but I do remember the horses and the carriage. He was driving a match team of all white horses. His family was a bit better off than most and could afford such a luxury. Not that Paul was snobbish, mind you, but they were able to afford what they wanted. The sun was shining down on those gorgeous horses when he came toward our house. The metal pieces of the harness just danced with the sunlight, and the leather fairly gleamed with its oiling. Every part of the team and carriage could have served as a guide for how a well-decked team and carriage should look. The carriage itself was polished and painted and balanced, and those who knew Paul knew this was not unusual. He was already a successful man in his own business, and he was successful because he paid attention to details. Janelle once asked me, if he was so attentive to details, why did he come over that day? He came to pick up his bride. Not that I cared. I knew 
why he was there, but those horses took my attention from me. I liked horses. I liked to work them, train them, raise them, ride them, or work them on the carriage. I worked in the field to be with them. They are an amazing animal when you figure what we ask them to do, and they do it. Paul brought his carriage beside the house, and Father came out to meet him. If I wasn't all that interested in what they were saying, somehow I didn't feel it concerned me. Besides, I had to look at those horses, touch them, couldn't get enough of those beautiful Then, for some reason, I heard Paul, with a sad laugh, ask my father, Do you have another daughter that wants to get married? Their words prior to that question seemed to regroup in my head. I remembered earlier that day that my sister Abigail had, something, had said something about not wanting to get married. My sister and I were not very close. And I had only half heard as I was going out the door to get our horses ready for the ride to the wedding mass. I should have listened more. Father had to tell Paul, who had come to pick up Abigail, that she had indeed changed her mind. She did not want to be married. It was nothing against Paul. She just was not ready to get married. When Paul, this man with this magnificent pair of horses, asked, do you have any other daughters who want to get married? There could be only one answer. At this point in this story, my children give me a questioning look that says, didn't you think about But I did not think twice about it. And as I was racing to get on the seat, I heard myself say, I am. <laughs> Seated on the carriage, I could see my father and Paul. Paul's face had a look that said, are you serious, lady? And father's had one that said, get down from there, little girl. Father actually did say that. Paul, however, walked to the carriage, jumped up beside me, and said, let's go. And we rode off. By the time Father had hitched up another team and gotten into town, we had been married and nothing has separated us since. That ride was wonderful. The day was warm. And the horses had an even gait that meant a very smooth ride. All the way to church, I was thinking how glorious it was going to be being married to a man who could have horses like these. Janelle was about the only one who ever had the nerve to ask, you married a man because of his horses? The horses are gone now. There have been many other changes. Telephones, tractors, cars, electricity. But most people cannot really appreciate how fast horses quit being a major part of our lives. That speed of change is perhaps best illustrated by, by what happened about several years after my wedding. When I was 16, my oldest daughter, Helen, was born. She is Janelle's mother. Like most girls at this time, it was at home. Helen was born healthy, and at 25, she married. <coughs> Janelle's mother never liked horses, but she recalls horse-drawn wagon rides to school, and it was at school where she met her future husband although they didn't get married for another 15 years. When 
Jamil was to be baptized, Paul, our youngest son, Paul and our youngest son, Stephen, piled in the car to drive to Richmond for that baptism. When we were near St. Martin, Steve suddenly became very excited. Look, look, he shouted, there's a man plowing how fast it changed. In less than one generation, horses went from a mainstay of transportation, power for work, and relaxation that had existed for a thousand years to be a rarity and an oddity. I'll never forget the horses or those fast changing times. And today, a bit of those memories will Janelle called the other day and asked if I would ride with her to her wedding. I'm having a horse-drawn carriage pull me to church, she said. I want you and Grandpa to sit. At first I thought of declining, but then I thought, how many chances do we have to ride in a carriage behind horses? And I said, but she didn't end it there. She said, Grandma, with a bit of pleading in her voice, while we are riding there, can you tell the story of your wedding day and how the horses looked? It is this story I will enjoy telling. Yes. 
some of the missions could never be put into a movie. They can't make a movie horrible enough. I've never seen an air battle in movies that could compare to some we've been in. Being in it and watching it are two different things. They can't put this much suffering into a movie. At least it isn't the same. It was after the attack when I felt I was going crazy. My nerves were so strong. I didn't know if I was coming or going. I had three shots of whiskey after we got back and I felt much better. I might add the ambulance was busy today. This sort of stuff doesn't come out in the newspapers, but I imagine it will after the war. When and if I finish my mission here, so help me, I'm going to get myself grounded. They can bust me or anything else. They can even call me yellow. All I can do is think I've seen too much. The war ended. To the sounds of jubilation and thanks, John Brill and others did return home. While there was no doubt that many of them knew they accomplished something almost impossible, only time has truly allowed us to appreciate what they really accomplished in those days. In the late 1990s, almost 50 years after the war, William Brown of Colorado, who was a school teacher, wrote the following message to the veterans of World War II. The statement has been reprinted in a number of newspapers, including the Melrose Beacon. William Brown wrote, to the men and women of the generation who fought in World War II, thank you. You saved the world. No other generation in history can make that claim. Not the founders of the American Revolution, not the ancient Greeks or the Romans, not even the early Christians. Yet isn't it ironic that victory in the most intense, deadly, and important struggle in human history should have seemed so ordinary to those who won it and those who benefited the most from it? Those people who saved the world fought not for glory or honor, not for a lasting tribute on a printed page. They did it because it had to be done, and there was no one else available to do it. It isn't that others didn't contribute. They did. They suffered severe hardship, death, and destruction, and that is the point. With most of Britain in chains, with most of Europe in chains, with Asia teetering on the bridge of collapse and the Pacific in flames, and the incredibly brave English hanging on by their fingernails, it fell to the Americans to save the world from fascist domination. And who were these valiant warriors who secured the blessings of freedom and liberty for the world back in those dark days? Superman? Millions of Davids or King Richards or an equally important historical figure? Hardly. They were men and women, ordinary people. They were your aunts, your uncles, your brothers, your sisters, your parents and grandparents. They all deserve our thanks. No individual or group has ever matched that achievement, and God willing, no one will ever have to again. With the war ending, America enjoyed one of its most prosperous times ever. Some of those days have also faded into the realm of the good old days. It was also at that time that some made a very definite impression in the local area. Baseball became a ritual in various communities in this area. Teams in the communities such as St. Martin and Meyer Grove, New Munich and Melrose, El Rosa, Spring Hill, can all trace their roots back to the 1930s and even earlier. In 1980, Mary Littmer, a Meyer Grove native, wrote the following. I remember most especially Sundays. Sundays was baseball. After church, players and fans clustered on the sidewalk for quick predictions and last-minute unofficial meetings before drifting home for lunch. After dinner, everyone began to drift back to the ball field. Lean young players came first, followed by their aunts, uncles, children, cousins, parents, wives. There is no mistaking the air of a Sunday afternoon baseball game. It is a sunny blend of copper tones, Marlboro, sweat, alfalfa, and paps. I can still hear the bat cracking. I can see the peeling scoreboard in fall off center field. I can see my father signaling a risky late ending suicide squeeze from his place at third base. I remember how when we were young, some of us could be brought to tears by the loss of a tournament game. All the people who grew up in Min, Minnesota know what I'm talking about. What she touched on in that editorial was that baseball has become part of the community 
and part of the families in this area. Yet by looking at your pictures, 
People still farm with horses and raise chickens in the hay barns. I've noticed that you go to great lengths to show women in management positions, minorities as positive images, and senior, ci senior citizens as active. Why are you half a century behind the times when it comes to portraying farmers? In case you are interested, I am using our home computer to send this to you. The same computer my parents used to get an exchange of variety of information from the university and other sources. Catch on. It's not farmers who are behind the times. It's you. Now, send it. Oh, I see I have a message. Send me. I will pick you up later. Robert. Who's Robert? <laughs> Robert's in one of my classes. He's picking up in a little bit. He's picking me up in a little while for the football game. And Robert asked you all on computer? Not a telephone? I would think that if the gentleman is going to ask my daughter out, he would at least use a telephone. Mom, everybody uses the internet to communicate today. Don't worry, I'm not going to just run out there and just beep the horn. Well, I certainly hope not. Hello? I'll be right out. I gotta go. He just drove up in his car. Uh, out to tell about their lives, their joys, their sorrows, and their times. This program is not a history. It's a story of historical times. A story of people who lived a century ago, or maybe a day ago, but people who lived and lived before us. It's not a story of real individuals, although some did live, but it is a story and the message of a life that we continue to write each day.